to our event. We're going to get started in just a moment. Thank you for patiently waiting in the waiting room. <laughs> Okay, I think we can actually just get started. Um, thank you everyone for coming to our event. My name is Hadil Hamoud and I am the president of Jehud Magazine. We are an undergraduate publication on the Middle East and North Africa at Duke University. And uh, my colleague Maya is here and she'll introduce herself. Hi, my name is Maya. Um, I'm the justice coordinator for the Undergraduate Environmental Union. Um, we're the organization on campus that uh, arranges undergraduate environmental programming. And we are incredibly honored today to have um, Dalit Wolf, Nada Majdalani, and Nisreen El Siam um, to discuss generally environmentalism in the Middle East and North Africa, but specifically we'll be asking them questions about their work, um, some of the challenges they face due to COVID, um, and kind of the, where they see um, environmental activism and peace building moving forward within the region. So we're incredibly excited for a very productive conversation. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off to Maya to begin the event. Great. Um, thank you so much. So uh, for our speakers, we were wondering if uh, you could all just first introduce yourselves and briefly describe the work you do to promote environmental activism or advance environmental peace building. Um, and then we can start with Nisreen and then Hamna and then Dalit. Thank you very much, Maya and Hadil. My name is Nisreen Al Saim. Uh, I'm 25 years old from Sudan, and uh, I'm the chair of Sudan Youth Organization on Climate Change, which is a youth-led organization here in Sudan. I'm also the chair of the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. Uh, it's an um, advisory group uh, from seven young people around the world advising the Secretary General on climate action and youth movement. And we are right now like having like a small bridge between young people around the world and also the Secretary General. Um, I've been doing climate activism uh, uh, since um, 2014 and environmental activism in general since 2012. I was a freshman at the university at that time. So I'm very glad to be with undergrad uh, community and university community very much. Uh, basically, I'm a physicist and I have a master's degree on renewable energy. Yeah, that's very much it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nada, if you could introduce yourself. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the uh, uh, around the world. My name is Nada Majdalani. I'm the Palestinian director of EcoPeace Middle East. Um, I'm uh, a mother of two daughters, uh, and I've been engaged with uh, EcoPeace for the past three years. Um, it's been a wonderful journey. It's a, a dream that came true in terms of my career life. I've always wanted to be engaged in environmental peace building. Um, I'll come more towards uh, maybe at some point the story of why uh, um, why I, I wanted to be here um, in terms of, of my career. Um, uh, and uh, for those who don't know uh, Echo Peace Middle East, we are a trilateral environmental peace building organization uh, working in Palestine, Israel and Jordan, uh, focusing on uh, um, working with the communities, with students and teachers and farmers and uh, community leaders um, on uh, building constituencies on common concerns um, regarding environmental and water and sanitation issues. Um, and uh, we also um, uh, work on, a, on, on the advocacy level and policy change level with our stakeholders and governments each um, in our countries. Um, and uh, we try to influence uh, cross-border uh, environmental uh, cooperation. Um, and most recently, we're also focusing a lot on climate change adaptation and mitigation throughout um, several, of, um, several aspects of our work uh, and concepts that we're trying to promote. And we'll come to this uh, further um, in our discussion. To you, Dalit you can describe also more of what we're doing. Yes, I hope I don't I will repeat. Uh, um, so I'm Dalit Wolf. I'm EcoPeace's Israeli Deputy Director and the Regional Development Director. Uh, I joined EcoPeace four years ago 
and I found myself part of a truly unique organization. Uh, we are the only organization that exists in any field that is Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanians working together. And indeed, we work, as, yeah, as Nana said, at the three offices in Ramallah, in Amman, in Jordan, and Tel Aviv uh, in Israel. And we're overall around 60 staff, with every staff person working on a daily basis with their counterparts in the other offices. And indeed, our, our work focuses particularly on water, because we recognize that water can be a source of conflict, but equally uh, a cause for cooperation. And our strategy combines bottom-up community-based actions and education with top-down advocacy. Much of our work is focused on cross-border watersheds. For example, we advance a re rehabilitation of the Jordan River by working with youth on all sides of the border to advance environmental awareness with decision makers, with donors, with the private sector, to facilitate investments in water and sanitation projects along the river. And we also seek to address the water and sanitation crisis in Gaza, water scarcity in the West Bank, water pollution crossing borders. And we really aim to place it on the agenda of our decision makers, policies that meet the challenges posed by climate change in our region. <clears throat> and we are, um, in, that, in that sense, we're currently calling for a Middle East Green Blue Deal, which I'm sure Nadal will tell you more about, with the addition of blue, because really we want to highlight the importance of climate-induced water scarcity in our region. We also have invest heavily in education. Uh, we want to engage, especially the younger generation, to understand the importance of diplomacy in water and climate fields as a means of conflict resolution and peace building. And we work both with schools and with regional leadership programs to encourage young people to become more knowledgeable about the transboundary nature of the environmental challenges in our region and develop innovative thinking about ways to resolve local and regional environmental problems using new tools such as diplomacy, citizen engagement, and technology to implement hands-on projects. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for those really in-depth um, introductions. And it's really exciting to hear about the work that you all do. It's incredibly important. Um, something that each of you mentioned is an emphasis on youth engagement. Um, Dalit, you just mentioned youth involvement in the restoration of the Jordan River, as well as an emphasis on youth education as part of this bottom up, uh, bottom up approach. And Nisreen, obviously you are a youth activist. You're on the UN Youth Advisory Group on Climate Change. So we're wondering if each of you can kind of talk about how you effectively engage Engage youth on environmental issues and why the focus on youth is important, particularly in the Middle East and North Africa. And maybe we can start with you, Nisreen. Okay. Um, well, um, I doubt uh, that I'm a youth anymore. <laughs> I feel so old. <laughs> okay. Um, well, in um, um, so I will start from the national level first. So Sudan Youth Organization on Climate Change is mainly uh, there because of three things. First of all, we uh, believe that knowledge is the power and um, like uh, expanding knowledge and raising the awareness of the public about climate change might help us and the public also to adapt and also to mitigate um, the reasons of uh, global warming and then climate change. So we try to raise the awareness in the public, not only young people, but with emphasis on young people, because we believe that uh, climate change is starting to hit us. We did not reach the peak yet, and the peak um, is uh, something forecasted for 10 to uh, 30 years from now, which is we will be the adult at that time, we will be the seniors of that time. And we think that prevention is better than cure. So being having the next generations or the younger generations in the decision making from now uh, will help us to actually mitigate the issues that we will, we will face in the future due to climate change. The second reason why we have Sudan Youth uh, Organization on Climate Change is to um, have climate change policies and climate change regulations within different countries, especially the developing countries and especially the least developed countries like Sudan, where we don't have uh, enough policies and regulations regarding climate change. And the policies and regulations we have it, we have a huge gap in the implementation process and so on. So um, 
having these policies and regulations and then engaging people in making these policies and regulations is uh, our second goal. The third goal is when whenever we try to engage young people in different uh, legislations and advocacy campaigns and so on, we get to ask this question a lot. Where are the capable, cap uh, professional young people? So we try to also build the capacity of young people and make them ready to have uh, uh, this participation within the policy making or the decision making thing. So um, doing things in a complementary way where you actually raise the awareness of the public, you build the capacity of young people, you advocate for policies, but then you push the young people, you build the capacity of to be part of these uh, policies and regulations making process is the ultimate goal. Now we move to uh, the regional level. There is a lot of groups in Africa and also in the Middle East that works in climate change. There is the AIC, the African Youth um, Initiative for Climate Change. There is the, the, the Greenpeace Mean Region. There is the uh, um, Can Arab World. There is a lot of different organizations that works on climate change and young people in the region and networking between all of these and sending different opportunities to different bodies so they can have access to a finance, have access to networking with others and so on is a very much uh, uh, something desirable these days. Um, let's go to the international world. Well, we had 25 years of climate negotiation. If anyone is familiar with the World Cup, which is Conference of Parties, where uh, all different countries who actually signed the, um, uh, uh, the Paris Agreement and also the Climate Change Convention meet and negotiate. And, uh, we have 20 years of, of negotiation, but we um, generally believe that if young people have more space in these negotiations and have more space in the international community and have more seats on the table, decision making will be faster, uh, justice will be happier and so on, um, because we don't actually have any reasons to uh, um, um, to lie or to have other priorities. Our first priority is the future and the planet and to have uh, a healthy environment for us and for the next generation. Other uh, maybe partners or other part of the communities might have different interests, like, for example, money, uh, oil and gas industry, the economical system, so on and so on. But I think young people are very much keen and very much honest when it comes to their priority. And that's why it's very important to include young people in this uh, areas. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you so much. That You brought up a lot of incredible points, especially about the way youth can, um, the importance of youth at different levels of um, climate change impacts. Um, Dalit and Nada, would you, um, yeah, I'd like to talk about EcoPeace's work and also emphasis on youth, enga youth engagement. Sure, yeah, Nada, would you like to start? Okay, so, uh, so indeed, I think like everywhere in the world, we're seeing that youth are already inclined to have more of an interest in environmental issues than many adults, especially um, in relation to climate change. And, and we really think it's essential that youth, as the demographic group that will most suffer the consequences of inaction, are given access to information and become more knowledgeable about the impact of climate change in their lifetime. So what do we do uh, in that regard? Uh, we run, we do two, we have two main programs. Uh, one is we run national school programs in Jordan, Palestine, and Israel that take place, and this is really important, as part of the regular school curriculum. So we offer, we work uh, in public high schools, and, that, and through that, reach thousands of youth. Uh, what we do with this youth is we offer trainings on environmental issues and climate change issues. We offer them tours that we, that we call neighbor path tours. We do summit events, um, and most importantly, we encourage them to, uh, to uh, um, implement projects in their own communities. And our strategy here, is, why are we doing this? Is because we believe that if we manage to embed our programming where possible into existing networks, and the school system is obviously a very big network, then we can really go much, much further in terms of our impact and reach many more youth. So we've done that by building a curriculum that matches really the needs of the teachers in different school top topics, and then adding our content in that context, and then training the teachers and supporting them throughout the year so that they will indeed teach uh, those lessons. And this strategy has worked really well. In Israel, for example, uh, we've been able to connect to a diplomacy program 
uh, and we teach water diplomacy to thousands of students uh, from all sectors of society uh, at the, who then go on and as their matriculation uh, uh, obligation do two, three to four month projects often on water as part of their matriculation. So that's one side of what we do with youth. The other side is much more selective program, which like Nisreen, uh, um, we really identify and empower emerging young leaders. And then we engage them in, in regional cross-border activities. And we aim to create a network of regionally sensitive young leaders and professionals who will work together to advance regional water environment solutions. And here we have three tracks. We work on the one hand with youth leaders, maybe 15, 16 year olds. We work with young professionals and we work with young entrepreneurs. And just to give an example um, of, of some of the youth who have participated and the young professionals, uh, last year we had um, a young guy in Israel called Michael Beckland, who was involved uh, with Spike for Future Israel. And he was already organizing uh, climate activities in the community, even bring together a Palestinian and uh, an Israeli um, uh, youth striking together for, for climate under the heading, this is bigger. And I think that's the kind of youth that we're trying to, to attract. And we then work with them and give them master classes and we create a regional network of youth that will then work together uh, on these kind of projects. Another example is from our Young Professionals program. Uh, we had last year a really good cohort of, um, of Israeli students and Palestinians working together. And one of the projects that they came up with was, uh, was for example, a documentary that they want to film together about the Jordan River that will hopefully um, you know, be a big success and, and reach uh, film festivals. So that's a kind of where we are. Um, and um, Nana, anything you want to add to that? Thank you, Dalit. You've uh, just described it uh, really nicely. Um, I, I don't think I would want to add much, but I think to just, uh, I would like to reemphasize the importance of education and awareness and uh, building this awareness from an early age, because um, also as Nasreen mentioned, we're just trying to um, shape and form the mindset of the upcoming leaders of, of our region. And, uh, I think what uh, we do individually towards every participant um, uh, in building their, you know, not only skills and knowledge and capacity, but also the personality is uh, just very rewarding because very much of what we do on ground in our region in terms of capacity, you know, uh, advocacy and, and working with the stakeholders, it, it can be very frustrating because the turnout is very low. The, the turnout of, you know, the results cannot be seen as quickly as we want them because of, you know, either the bureaucracies on the governmental level or because of the political conflict and lack of political will. But when we work with the youth, the turnout and the results are much faster. We see the impact uh, instantly on uh, how they react and how they um, uh, bring in the, uh, the results into their communities. It's like a snowball effect and how they engage with their peers, how they speak about what they've learned to their parents. And I think one of the most uh, touching stories that I recall from one of our participants. It was a Palestinian young participant who came back from a summer camp in Jordan, um, a regional uh, summer camp. And uh, his mom uh, sent us a letter to thank us. First of all, she said, before thanking us, she said, what have you done to my son? And before I really even started, you know, reading the rest of the, I was, I was, oh my God, what have we done to her son? <laughs> but um, when I elaborated in, in reading, she said, my son came back as a grown up. He came back more mature. He wants to learn more about the environmental issues of the region. He wants to know more about climate change. He wants to know more about the political context and the, uh, the conflict and how can we change um, the perception about each other um, across the border. 
between Palestinians, Israelis, and Jordanians. He wants to read more uh, newspapers, watch the news, work out. It's a complete personality transformation for our uh, participants who come back as um, more mature, more aware, more engaged individuals in their societies. This is exactly the, the, the um, essence or the, uh, I don't know what you call it. This is, I'm turning into French now. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a building block of, uh, of becoming a leader in the future. And uh, if I recall my own also experience, um, I've been engaged when I was 14, 15 years old. Um, after, you know, around the Oslo Agreement, it started to become very popular to be engaged in uh, peace building activities between youth. And um, I was engaged in environmental peace building. And only then I learned the concept of environment, also borders and boundaries. And um, I think this is what got built up in my subconscious, this concept that grew up with me to understand how our environmental realities are very much connected and that we cannot disengage from catastrophes across the border. So here I am because of what I've been uh, exposed to during my youth. Um, I am kind of seeing now how the entire experience back then has shaped my reality and and um, brought me towards uh, this career and this path. Thank you so much for your responses. Yeah, it's um, it's very important to see how how youth are engaging in these kinds of issues. Um, the next set of questions are going to be uh, directed towards the screen. Um, just talking about uh, her work in Sudan and with youth climate activism. Um, so Nasreen, so could you first tell us about your work with Sudan Youth for Climate Change and the UN's Youth Advisory Group on, on Climate Change as well? Like what are your roles in these organizations and what kind of projects are, or work have you done? Well, um, in um, Sudan Youth Organization on Climate Change, we try to, as I mentioned earlier, to raise the awareness of the public so I think we may have lost Nisreen. Mm, maybe we'll give it a few moments and then if not, we can actually just ask um, you all questions while her connection restores. Okay, yes. Um, in the meantime, Nisreen, just let us know when you get connection. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, but in the meantime, we can kind of shift to eco peace then. Um, I, Dalit and Nada, if each of you can maybe describe your roles as deputy directors um, and kind of the projects that you've been involved in. So similar question, but just applying it to your work. So Nada's actually the director and I'm the deputy director. Um, now that's the Palestinian director, and I'm the Israeli deputy director. Now that would you let me do you want to start? So um, as, as Dalit mentioned, our portfolio of activities and work is very diverse. Uh, we've uh, Dalit has elaborated on our educational uh, programs, uh, but when it comes to um, maybe the other level of programming and maybe uh, the role of uh, the leadership team, as we call it in Ecopies, uh, of the lead, uh, my colleagues, Gidon and Yana, the directors in, in Jordan and, uh, uh, and Israel. Uh, and also we have also a couple of other stars in, uh, in, for, for pro program and finance uh, in, uh, in our leadership team. At this level, we focus a lot on, um, uh, on advocacy and building our strategy and how 
to engage further with international community and with our stakeholders and how do we strategize exactly um, and be flexible uh, towards the changes also on the ground because our region as much as uh, things are moving slowly towards you know making uh, changes on ground however there's a lot of fluctuation in the political reality um, um, lots of fluctuation in terms of the um, the coldness or heat in terms of the relationships between the countries and governments um, and um, maybe we'll talk about this later, but uh, it is our role then at the leadership level to, um, to be as flexible uh, as possible to changes. Um, also last year, of course, uh, we had COVID-19 and we had to come up together with, uh, of course, with engaging with the technical team who's working on the ground uh, and on the implementation on how do we tackle these you know, new realities in terms of COVID and in terms of also some of the political challenges that we came to. Um, so um, I would say uh, that two of our important concepts uh, that we um, are focusing on uh, in uh, uh, at, uh, at another level, which is not the education level, is the Jordan Valley um, uh, Sustainable Development. Um, in 2015, we have developed a master plan uh, that is regional focused on developing infrastructure projects uh, for Palestine, Israel, and Jordan, um, uh, mostly focused on water, sanitation, uh, renewable energy, uh, ecological um, uh, conservation, um, ecotourism, and agricultural innovation. Um, and in these sectors, of course, we required working with, um, with our respect, uh, respective governments, uh, each from his office, um, to basically find out the priority projects that are needed to be implemented. Uh, unfortunately, because of, of course, the political reality, we cannot move forward with the large scale projects that we envisioned. However, in parallel, uh, we have developed a, a track for working with impact investors and the business community. Uh, and therefore, we started mapping what kind of business opportunities in sectors that are relevant to climate change adaptation and mitigation uh, are there in the Jordan Valley. Um, and what we aim through this is to actually showcase that um, Investing in businesses and green businesses and creating green jobs is the way forward for our region, particularly to address the un unemployment uh, issues and the poverty uh, and food security issues um, in our region. And why we focus on the Jordan Valley, because it's the food basket of our region. It is uh, as it ho has always been, of course, historically, but because of water stress and because of the conflict and because of climate change, uh, the situation, uh, the environmental situation and the um, economic situation uh, is deteriorating over there. Um, and therefore, we're trying to focus on uplifting the economy of the Jordan Valley from currently a 4 billion US dollar to a 75 billion US dollar economy by 2050 by actually um, implementing uh, specific infrastructure projects that are uh, basically mentioned in our uh, regional master plan, but also um, in parallel working with the investment community and uh, business community to actually showcase by small and medium enterprise uh, projects um, that uh, knowledge exchange and cooperation can actually lead to a mutual um uh let's say um uh, mutual uh, mutual gains um and mutual prosperity uh, for the region the other concept which is important is the water energy nexus and it's built on the coal and steel agreement uh, um, uh, which brought the european union from the ashes of world war ii and in this we um, uh, we propose that uh, a renewable energy from Jordan can be exchanged with desalinated uh, uh, water from the shores of the Mediterranean on the uh, Palestinian and the Israeli side 
and therefore create a form of interdependency um, between the three countries, which would uh, have uh, environmental, uh, economic, and also geopolitical gains uh, for all three countries. Um, and combining all these together uh, is, um, along with another fourth, more complicated file, which I can speak about later, I don't want to take much of your time, uh, is what makes up what we call a green-blue deal for the Middle East. And this is what currently um, us as a leadership uh, of Ecopeace is trying to promote among the international community and the diplomatic level um, and also our stakeholders. So this is kind of what we do at the moment. Nisreen is back. Yes, hi Nisreen. Sorry we lost you. Um, we can actually, we'll, we'll ask some of our questions for EcoPeace and then go back to you Nisreen. But don't worry, we'll definitely save time to definitely dive into the work that you're doing. <laughs> um, all right, so the next question is uh, directed about trust and, and uh, confidence building within uh, the issues that EcoPeace addresses. Um, so we want to know that there are clear power imbalances between Palestinians, Jordans, and Israelis. Um, Neda, you've stated in an address to the 2019 UN Security Council that as we speak today, 97% of the groundwater under Gaza is not suitable for human consumption. After more than 12 years of blockade, consecutive wars, and loss of life, including children, and the failure of internal Palestinian reconciliation, a human catastrophe in the Gaza Strip is happening right now, right before our eyes. Uh, given this complex political reality, um, how do you build trust and cooperation in the region? We build trust based on speaking the language of our nations and speaking the language of our people. When we engage with our stakeholders and with our participants um, and young leaders, we highlight the national interests. Why do we need cooperation? Why, uh, what are our needs on ground today? Uh, what are our needs today in order to be um, uh, safeguarded from the impacts of climate change, safeguarded from uh, water stress and water insecurity? Um, and what do we need as a nation uh, today to improve the situation? And the answer uh, is usually is um, always fixed within the narrative and the needs of each country on its own. For Palestinians, it's uh, always the question of uh, how do we uh, build an independent Palestinian state? How do we uh, reach towards a level of water security? How do we uh, gain our water rights as Palestinians? Um, uh, how do we uh, deal with the issue of, of occupation, etc.? cetera? Uh, for Israelis, it's always the uh, question of security uh, and, and the security of, of the nation and protection of people. Uh, for the Jordanians, it is also um, uh, in a similar state uh, how to address uh, the difficulties that they're facing as a regional uh, sponge for all the wars and, and horrors that are happening around them, including the Iraqi war, the Syrian civil war, the having to deal with the refugees and um, the water stress that is coming from uh, the uh, you know the um, uh, the, ref the refugees influx in Jordan. So when we speak to our stakeholders and to our people, we always highlight the mutual interest. Uh, sorry, the national interest. But again, we uh, embed within that a mutual gain. What do we gain from cooperation? It is always good to highlight that we cannot disengage from our realities and we cannot disengage from. Uh, the fact that we are all in the same boat when it comes to climate change. Um, I always have this metaphor that um, it's, it's not about who has the most capable capacity or capacity or who's more capable to deal with climate change issues. 
um, um, it always climate change, of course, hits uh, those who are mostly vulnerable, uh, and the systems uh, um, and and uh, countries who do not have the adaptive capacity to deal with the impacts. Um, and often, it it doesn't mean that those who have the capacity are not vulnerable, but they can be impacted by things that happen on you know their neighbor's side. Um, and the metaphor that I use that we are all on a Titanic. Um, some can be, you know, at the top of uh, the ship in the first class with the champagne, but others can be, um, you know, uh, in uh, uh, in the lower class uh, rooms. But uh, once the ice hurts, uh, the iceberg hits the Titanic. Everybody sinks, and here's why we all need to pull our strings together and address climate change issues together. When it comes to trust, this is exactly what we're talking about, is that we need to trust that we need each other when we face these common challenges and common threats. Um, and when we look at the realities today, um, in comparison to actually years or 25 years ago, um, there, there's an opportunity that water and climate change be um, a low hanging fruit uh, and be um, an opportunity for uh, basically a, a building trust between the parties. Um, bringing an example of the water issue between Palestinians and Israelis, 25 years ago when water was uh, put as one of the uh, five, five final status um, core issues for negotiations in Oslo, uh, between Palestinians and Israelis, uh, water was a zero-sum game. Uh, it only produced uh, winners and losers. Um, because we were negotiating over natural water resources. But today, with the advancement on, of technology, and pre precisely on the Israeli side, with uh, desalination and reuse of treated wastewater, we're now talking about an increased water pie which means that negotiating over water became more attainable. Um, it will not produce winners as, and losers anymore. It will have a win-win approach where everybody can walk out the door uh, from a negotiations table and be happy about the results because um, one, this, this file is basically one of the um, least complicated files today in comparison to other files of the conflict, which is uh, potentially um, uh, more complicated to resolve because it's linked to more ideological issues, similar to the issue of um, Jerusalem, uh, the issue of the borders of the Palestinian state, the issue of illegal settlements uh, uh, within the, the West Bank. So these are complex issues that um, require a lot of effort uh, and and trust is required to put people on the ground to discuss them. But when it comes to water and because it's practical, it's, um, as I mentioned, it's um, uh, the mindset now is different uh, in terms of, uh, because also of the change of technology uh, and the change of realities on ground, this has become uh, more of a potential trust building measure that would bring people together to be able actually to discuss the more difficult files. Deli, do you want to add? No, you said it perfectly. Yeah, that was incredibly informative. Um, and it's really interesting to see the model and strategies you use to kind of build trust from the bottom up. Um, we can go back to Nisreen um, for the um, latter half. And 
yeah, I know you dropped the links um, for information about the Sudan Youth for Climate Change, UN Youth Advisory Groups uh, on climate change. So um, I wanted to ask that you've proposed uh, like this three stage strategy that could help Sudan out of the climate crisis and create a long term solution to climate adapt adaptation. And we're wondering if maybe you can explain this strategy and idea for us more and kind of what obstacles there are to implementing it. Yes, um, before I answer the question, I have a short video um, I would like to show, if possible. So I will just share my screen and open the video. Um, it will just give you a dimension on how deep is the climate uh, crisis in Sudan and, um, and how, how hard it is to actually uh, uh, deal with it. Um, if you want to just put unmute the video, I think the volume is a little. It says unable to play the video during the call, so I guess it's uh, just a second. Yeah, I think we are unable to hear the video, but if you uh, send me the link, I can do it. And in the meantime, maybe you can talk about the strategy and then I can show the video. Yeah, so, so um, um, well, in every country, there is um, um, a structure of actually um, how can we like differently uh, solve or adapt with climate crises. Of course, regarding climate change, there is two parts of story. There is the mitigation where we actually reduce the emissions of the greenhouse gases, which cause um, climate um, change or which cause specifically the global warming. And the second part is adaptation, where you only adapt with the impact of climate change and the crises that climate change produce. Um, in a country like Sudan, so the whole African continent is only responsible for 1.3% of the global emissions, while US, for example, is responsible for more than 17% of the global emissions. So uh, the whole African continent have um, 54 uh, countries. And if we, took, uh, if we took Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa out, um, there is only 1% of emissions, uh, I think, uh, from uh, the, the, the uh, 51 countries of Africa. If you divided this by, uh, by, uh, by the 50, but 1% by the 50, it's almost 0.02% of the emissions. And if you decided to calculate how much Sudan is emitting, you will find that Sudan is emitting around 0.08%, um, 0.008%, uh, I guess, or something like this. It's so small and so neglectable. But Sudan is one of the least developed countries and it's very vulnerable to climate change because more than 70% of farmer, pastor, and people who depends on the nature for their daily basis and so on. And, and this uh, issue actually um, causes different, uh, different, different uh, categories or let me say different implications. For example, um, as a farmer, uh, I get very much disturbed by how much water I receive. So if the rainy season decided to shift from May to July, which is the, something that's happening uh, lately in the last uh, years, then I have two months wasted. I cannot cultivate the land. I cannot put my seed. Uh, and also then it means that um, uh, I will collect my crops later. And then sometimes the winter comes before I collect my crops and so on. So there is a huge issue in that. Also, as a uh, as a, uh, a farmer, some crops doesn't actually take 
a very much high um, uh, temperature and it needs a very low temperature like wheat, for example. If we want to uh, grow wheat, we have to have a, a very, um, let me say, chill or cool uh, weather. And normally in Sudan, we had three months of cool weather, which is uh, December, uh, January and February. Now, unfortunately, we have only a few, uh, three weeks uh, of cold weather. Uh, today and in, in Sudan it was 49 degrees. Yesterday it was 40, 42 degrees, and we are only in March. I mean, April did not start yet. Um, so the global warming is reaching us and hitting us very much. Not speaking about the floods that we normally have. Not speaking about the conflict that raises because of droughts, because of other issues, and and the conflict have very much big implications. People migrate, and the migration might. Um, cause other conflicts itself, um, floods may cause um, uh, waterborne diseases like cholera, like typhoid. So the implications of climate change in Sudan is huge, and in a lot of countries, a lot of countries like Sudan. Um, so uh, government uh, put a lot of plan, but sometimes they don't put climate change in top of their agendas, um, and they put plan and they don't give enough budget for these plans to be implemented. And they put plans, but it becomes very much unrealistic because there is no money to implement it, no um, uh, experts to actually implement it, and they don't um, uh, consult the community enough. So as a civil society, we try to consult the community, we try to also mobilize the resources for the implementation. And sometimes if there is no plan at all, we suggest plans for the government. Uh, and the most important is to make sure that we have young people included in every step of, of this plan, uh, planning, implementing, and even mobilizing the, the resources for, for, for it. I will stop now. I will try to find the link and send it to you. <laughs> um, no problem. We actually found the link and I think um, we're going to share the screen and so that we can display the video. Sorry, one second, we're having just some technical difficulties. Time has passed to wonder if there is climate change or not. We all know that there is a climate change. Time has passed to wonder, is it a natural thing or a human-made thing? We all know climate change is a human-made thing. Time has passed to ask, is it a good thing to have a climate change or is it a bad thing? We all see, feel, and experience the bad effects of climate change. This video is trying to open your eyes. If you are a person in your home, if you are a policymaker, decision maker, world leader, or small young person living in this planet, do. So I think that was a really great just preview of some of the impacts of climate change, especially in vulnerable countries like Sudan. Um, and I think uh, Maya is actually going to tie this into peace building with. Uh, the uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which we also want to ask you about. So, Maya, go ahead. Um, yes, so we wanted to ask this, Serene, um, how does the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam fit into larger conversations about sustainability in Sudan? Um, what role can Sudan play in reaching a resolution regarding the dam? And how does peace building fit into this um, issue? Well, the issue of Ethiopian dam is just like the issue of climate change. Uh, it's purely scientific, but because of its high interest of some countries, it was shifted to high political. And um, while it's very clear that the Nile have a certain amount of water, every country of the 11 country of the Nile Basin, the Nile Basin have 11 countries. Um, just to give a small background on this, so the Nile is not a one river, as a lot of people know. The Nile is actually um, 
one, two, two big rivers. The White Nile is coming from the Lake Victoria in Uganda. And the Blue Nile comes from, um, yes, uh, comes from the Ethiopia uh, highland, which is uh, the Tana Lake. Uh, uh, the White Nile and the White Nile comes from the south and the um, Blue Nile comes from the east and they meet in Khartoum, uh, which is the capital of Sudan and they proceed to Egypt as one Nile. Uh, until uh, the Nile reached the Mediterranean. Uh, from um, uh, Lake Victoria and also Lake Tana, there are more than 11 um, small rivers that feed into the Nile. Um, most of these rivers are in Sudan itself. Uh, it's um, a seasonal river that feeds the Nile whenever there is rain and so on. Uh, in, in the 1950s, uh, the Egyptian government built the high dam uh, on the border of um, uh, of uh, Sudan and Egypt in the northern border. And um, the high dam, uh, the Egyptian high dam, caused a lot of damage for the Sudanese land uh, because it drowned huge uh, part of, of the Sudanese uh, land and also um, some of our archaeological sites, um, some of our temples, and uh, some of um, the very um, uh, value historical uh, pieces. Um, now, um, uh, they, as a downstream, they are a downstream country, uh, they have more than 14, uh, 48 and 48 million um, cubic meter from, uh, from the Nile itself. And um, in the Sudan, have only 18. And when you count Ethiopia and the other um, countries of, 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 uh, of the Nile Basin, they have a very few of uh, worse water share from, uh, from the Nile. Uh, now, the High Ethiopian Dam uh, will um, shift this uh, power uh, equation of power, let me say, regarding water. And uh, we all know that uh, water is the next war. People think that the, the third war might happen because of nuclear weapon or whatever, but I am sure because uh, water is life and life is water. And we have uh, every day a very much limitation in the waters up here. Uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, anything, any conflict happened, then it will happen because of the water. So um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a climate change scientist, I say that the dam have many impacts on the climate of the area because the area will move from an arid or semi-arid into a wetland, which is a total different uh, um, uh, scientific uh, implications and new uh, animals and new insects and new lifestyle will be in the area of the high dam. The dam is, uh, sorry, the Ethiopian dam. The dam is the, so big, so um, there is a huge security issue. If the dam fall or cracked or anything, all of the eastern side of Sudan will be underwater. Yet in Sudan, we have a lot of floats. We have a very irregular water flow in, in from the Blue Nile, and the dam will help us in that. So um, in order to think is the uh, Ethiopian dam good or a bad thing, we should uh, simply do it in a very scientific way. We have a cost benefit analysis. What is the Ethiopian dam going to cost us? And what is the, um, uh, the uh, uh, Ethiopian dam is going to benefit us? And simply, if it's going to cost us more than the benefits, then it's not something we need. Uh, it's not something uh, preferable, but if the benefits are more than um, the the be uh, the benefit is more than the cost, then it's something we welcome. Um, yeah, it's simply simply should be very much scientific, which is not the case now. It's so political, and this is not right. Yes, thank you so much. And it, it's actually interesting to hear you discuss um, like ideas of mutual interest or cost benefit analysis, especially after Nada and Dalit kind of discussed um, like how water can sometimes be viewed as a zero sum game. And it really is about like economic interest and, you know, who's benefiting from what. Um, and I think that's an it, it's an incredible thread through issues in two different parts of the region. Um, and yeah, but this is really incredible to hear.
And I think we are running short on time. And so thank you so much, everyone, for just kind of staying on. We're going to just ask one last question. Um, we apologize that we didn't have as much time as we hoped for for some audience uh, question and answers, but we want to be respectful of everyone's times. So um, our last question really for all three of you, and we can go around and answer, um, are kind of what your future plans are and what you're most hopeful about. So that can maybe end up more positive notes. Um, I know, Neza, you mentioned the Green New Deal for the Middle East, which is really exciting to hear about. And I know I, Maya and I really perked up when we heard that. Um, and so maybe each of you can kind of talk about something, you know, you're hopeful about for future projects. We can start with uh, Neda. Okay, I was thinking we can start with Dalit. Yes, yeah, Dalit too. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I, I, I took the previous question, so it's it's good that Dalit can. Okay. So indeed, the Green Blue Deal is a big deal, and we're very excited about it. Um, and uh, also the reception that we're seeing to the ideas proposed and to the advocacy level and, and the international community, the response has been just amazing. There's really a hunger for a strategy document and, and, and an advocacy approach like this that shows that there is a solution, that there is a way to move forward on all of these key issues, whether it's climate change, whether it's the Palestinian-Israeli water agreements, uh, whether it's the water energy nexus, and, and, and that's for us really a combination, I think, of many, many years of hard work uh, coming together into this document, into this approach. Um, at the same time, I have to say that I'm personally very excited about uh, Ecopeace embarking this year on its new five-year strategy, um, which will be very interesting for us to see how we can scale, how we can grow. Um, we are, besides our, our local programs uh, in the region, we also have a global program, uh, which we, we which will be we want to see grow. Um, we want to see how the models that we have uh, developed. Uh, in our own region can, can serve other countries around the world and other civil society organizations. Um, another thing that we're really excited about is our uh, the, the, the virtual um, programming that we've developed this past year in response to COVID. Uh, we have developed a, a virtual world where we have participants meeting uh, instead of in-person meetings, which have not been possible. And this virtual world is again uh, attracting a lot of attention worldwide. On, on, on how this model, and we're already uh, getting uh, requests from other organizations around the world on how they can potentially adapt it to their circumstances and to their uh, realities. And, and you, know, you know the term building back better, I think in, in, in our sense, that's really uh, what we're seeing, how, we could, how we've created value uh, that goes way beyond uh, the restrictions that we've seen this past year and, and will really uh, um, support and strengthen our programming in years to come. Um, in terms of challenges, I mean, we always have one central challenge beyond kind of the, the normal ones that you can expect. And that's that people should not lose hope. I think that's always our biggest challenge, uh, that change is possible, that peace is possible. Uh, and and we, you know, we need people to keep believing that, otherwise we cannot work. And I think that's where we come in, is to show, just to show even just our existence uh, is, is to show that it is possible and good things are happening in the Middle East. Uh, it's not all bad. And, and that's really, I think, what, you know, beyond really the, the, the content of our programming, that's the message that we bring. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Nada, do you want to add anything? Thank you, Dalit. This was very comprehensive. And uh, yes, definitely when it comes to now our uh, focus on the Green Blue Deal, as uh, Dalit mentioned, we're focusing on mobilizing foreign policy towards uh, advancing a Middle uh, Eastern uh, deal for environmental and climate change issues. Um, we are, uh, of course, as Dalit mentioned, building uh, on the uh, European uh, Green Deal, uh, which uh, definitely at some point uh, is uh, going to adapt, uh, adopt uh, some new foreign policies towards uh, not only uh, internally in the European Union uh, countries, but also towards 
uh, how to deal with uh, the Near East and, um, uh, and neighboring countries uh, uh, around Europe and the Mid around the Mediterranean. Um, we are uh, also envisioning uh, the strong, uh, um, let's say, return of the new US administration to um, uh, climate change action uh, with uh, the um, appointment of John Kerry into as a special uh, envoy for climate change, returning to the Paris Agreement. Um, I think these are things that uh, we're trying to build on as much as possible as opportunities um, to um, move forward our efforts here in the Middle East, not only for Palestine, Jordan and Israel, but also, as Dalit mentioned, to tackle um, uh, other difficult uh, watersheds uh, and areas of conflict, uh, such as the Nile Basin, uh, Tigris and uh, Euphrates, um, and also building on new opportunities with new geopolitical um, developments with the new agreements with, uh, of the Gulf countries with, uh, with Israel. I think uh, we have uh, some uh, new catalysts on the ground, especially after a difficult, let's say, four years in the, in, in, uh, during the past US uh, also administration um and the um also difficult political realities with uh, also threats of unilateral annexation to some areas of of the west bank by israel so all these realities over the past four years have been really difficult and now we're starting to see some er emerging um new opportunities and new catalysts that would potentially enable us to move forward with our concept uh, of a green-blue deal for the Middle East. Um, so we are now, as I mentioned, we're heavily focused on a lot of advocacy and diplomatic work uh, with uh, international community, um, both at the level of uh, the US administration and also European Union. And thankfully, we have um, a champion, which is uh, the foreign minister uh, of uh, Finland, uh, Pekka Havisto, who is um, willing to uh, move forward with a high level uh, foreign ministers meeting of the region um, and also uh, some of the most influential uh, international players here um, uh, from Europe and the US uh, to basically convene a roundtable discussion over the Green Blue Deal for the Middle East. And we're very much looking forward and we're very much thankful for uh, for his leadership and his championship towards uh, taking the role of trying uh, to basically put people together on uh, on the table to discuss these issues, um, particularly with the very good and strong history of Finland um, in striking deals over, you know, water diplomacy and transboundary uh, deals and agreements. Uh, so we're definitely looking forward uh, what comes next during this year. Thank you so much. Uh, we wanted to ask Nasreen about um, her future plans and, and hopes and challenges, but I think she lost connection possibly. Um, so with that, we can, we can end from here. Uh, thank you so much, Neda and Dali and Nasreen for uh, speaking with us and um, sharing your, your thoughts on um, environmental and the Middle East. We really appreciate uh, your time. Yes, thank you so much. We know it's the time difference. There's lots of logistical challenges. So we appreciate you also highlighting really incredible work happening in the region. And thank you so much everyone to the audience for coming to the event. Um, we hope that you check out also uh, EcoPeace. Uh, they dropped a lot of links um, so that you can view their website as well as the Sudan um, Youth for Climate Change and the UN Youth Advisory Group. Yes, um, I will. I have all the links and then I, I can send up a follow-up email to all the participants um, with all the links. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, email us and we can pass it on to the speakers. Yes. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Hadil and Maya. That was wonderful. <laughs> Great hosting. Thank